Good day, folks, and welcome to the Anorak Review Show, with I, your host, the Anorak. Hope you people have, have had a good Remembrance Day and Remembrance Sunday, and have done that tradition of two-minute silence to commemorate those who risked and gave their lives to fight for us and our country in the First World War. For now, though, it's time again to talk about White Snake. Last time I t- did so was when I covered their self-titled album, often referred to as 1987, after the year it came out. And in that review, I might have brought up how two well-known songs from said album were actually re-recordings of tracks from a prior album. So I figured I'd actually discuss a bit more in depth of that album sooner or later. So let's jump into White Snake's 1982 album, Saints and Sinners, and find out how how it may actually compare to what would come later. We begin the album with Youngblood, which goes right off to a good start, with an opening riff similar to something you'd hear out of Fog Hat or ACDC, no doubt performed by the talents of guitarists Mickey Moody and Bernie Marsden, the latter of which co-wrote this track. Then we get the equally awesome drums of Ian Pace, the bass of Neil Murray, and and of course, the leading vocals of David Coverdale. As he sings to comfort us in second person, if we feel rolling thunder and see lightning strike, he'll shelter us from the night. But it's probably going to turn out that the night was just celebrating bonfire night with the fireworks just a few days too late. When the wind's howling, He'll hold you near and soothe your troubled mind. Well, it's nice and kind of you to consider us, Mr. Coverdale, but I think you should also soothe the wind as well. He sounds like he might be suffering a toothache or something like that. And after a pretty cool pre-chorus bridge, where he tells us not to hold on to what we got, since he assures he's got what we need, assuming, of course, we can trust him with taking care of our personal belongings, we get that sweet, simple rocking chorus of Young Blood, your hot property, Young Blood. Hot property. I'd make a, a kinky BDSM joke, but I'm not sure if YouTube would allow even that. In the second verse, he brings up that the devil has got your number and wants you to hang on a line. Hacking someone's phone number and sending a death threat? What else do, what do you expect from the bloody devil? And after another chorus, we get a pretty decent guitar solo before we get another chorus, and the song ends with an organ chord from the late great John Lord. White Snake's Young Blood isn't exactly Rob Liefeld's Young Blood, but it does seem better written than that, and probably better drawn as well, too. Next is Rough and Ready with the D in AND being replaced with an apostrophe. At 2 minutes and 52 seconds, this is the shortest track on the album, but it still slaps hard nonetheless. A somewhat bluesy song about Dave essentially wanting a hard-on and looking for love, even willing to steal anything that he needs, and to do anything to his satisfaction guaranteed. Because that sure is the best way to a woman's heart. Theft, robbery, carjacking, shoplifting, all that stuff. Or maybe some women out there are actually into that. I don't know. In one verse, he warns women to lift up their skirts and run. For he's about to aim and shoot his pistol like a Gatling gun. I think we all know what he really means by that. But aside from all those... We still get a hard-going solo, and we get to hear more of John's organs here and there, even if it's still drowned over by the guitars and other instruments. This is a quick one that would no doubt get you rough and ready for the day. Assuming, of course, you can keep your libido still in check. Then we have Bloody Luxury, which is likely inspired by the American rock and roll music of the 1950s, like Chuck Berry, B.B. King... Muddy Waters, and Bo Diddley, with what seems to be a variant of the classic 12-bar blues. However, it still seems to manage to 
sound as hard rocking as it does, even with the faint, underlining little Richard-esque organ being a texture within the overall track. Plus, yet another screechingly exciting guitar solo as well as usual. The lyrics themselves also seem to reflect this sense of fun, easygoing, carefree, rebellious attitude that too is reminiscent of the music scene of the day, as David portrays himself as a barroom crooner, rolling along and singing heartbreak songs. Oh no, not, not songs about feeling sad, I mean, I mean he, he could actually break your heart, literally, by singing. You'd be lucky if you'd still be alive afterwards. And it's all a bloody luxury to him. And in that, there will be blood. And he'll drink her milkshake. And your milkshake. And he'll drink it up good. If you're into old 50s rock and roll, rockabilly music, or at least tributes to such, this might be a bloody luxurious track for you. Afterwards is Victim of Love. Not to be confused with Elton John's 1979 album of the exact same name and its title track, which were released about three years before this, and both seem to be about a person falling in, into love and worrying about being used and rejected. Hmm. There's not too much to say about this one in particular, the lyrics are just as straightforward as one might expect. David being all down for love, taking his chances whenever he can, like a lamb to the slaughter, being clean out of pain and yet being no stranger to the crying game. I guess David Coverdale is a big fan of that 90s thriller film. Or at least he would be since that film would come out a whole decade after this album. Pretty good predictor, I must say. Side 1 ends with Crying in the Rain, which I may have mentioned back in my 1987 review as being one of two songs re-recorded for that album. And at 6 minutes long, this is definitely the longest track on this album, longer even than the 87 re-recorded version by about 20 seconds or so. But there are other differences beyond just the running length and duration. While the 87 version is much more power rock in nature, this original 82 version is definitely more bluesier by a slight at least, even opening with a very quiet guitar solo within the first 13 seconds before starting off proper, but seems to be removed from the 87 version. According to David himself, this was because one of the new members of Whitesnake who was involved in that album at the time, guitarist John Sykes, Hated blues music, apparently. Okay. But that said, the lyrics themselves remain mostly the same. A cat black moans, burning with a fever. I guess, Sylv I guess Sylvester got sick with bird flu after managing to eat Tweety whole and raw. A stray dog howls when he's lonely in the night. That or when he stepped on a Lego brick that some kid left in the street. But even with all this sickness and craziness, David keeps dreaming dreams of tomorrow, feeling like he's wasting time and lighting candles in the wind. And it seems to me he lived his life like a candle in the wind, and his candle burnt out long before his legend ever did. While the sun may be shining, but in his heart it's still raining. This may likely represent how one may try to hide their inner feelings of sorrow and grief with a happy yet false smile. No one sees, feels, or understands his pain and heartache, not even his tears when he happens to be crying in the middle of rain. A gentle rain falls softly in his weary eyes, as if to hide a lonely tear. While the 87 version is somewhat slicker in its production, and has a slightly more powerful guitar solo and kind of goes on a more bigger bang. This original 82 version is a tad raw in nature. Personally and honestly, I enjoy both versions regardless. I still like both of them for being distinct, but still st still sounding similar enough so you could tell what's what. And this wouldn't be the only song of the album as I might have brought up. 
which I'll be getting into very soon.